Hey friends, welcome back again for another uh, short, today a little bit shorter than uh, the others, uh, conversation around uh, Christianity, Christian understanding of who Jesus is. Uh, so far we've covered kind of before and during the First World War, that's uh, where we've been paying the most attention. Uh, most of what I'm talking about can be found in uh, the book that I've got right here by me. Um, popular uh, Christology and the Great War. Um, <clears throat> this is what my uh, master's research kind of went into. Um, book is available on either Amazon or on Kindle, uh, on uh, on Amazon uh, for the Kindle or through uh, Barnes and Noble, either in print form or in uh, or Nook format. Um, any sales of this book over the next couple months, the all the profits will go back to. Uh, the work that our church is doing, um, either helping bridge the gap or as we find and meet needs of our neighbors. Um, so by buying the book, you're helping us kind of continue the work that we're trying to do. Um, again, it's called Popular Christology and the Great War. And today I want to spend a few minutes talking about one particular uh, branch of Christianity's uh, response to the Great War as kind of a case study uh, for uh, the relationship between uh, Christians and uh, churches and government and war and what happens when all of those things um, meet. Um, so I, I looked during my research specifically at the Churches of Christ because that's where uh, my, uh, my heritage is. Uh, I serve as a minister for Church of Christ. Um, obviously, we're streaming this video on Northside Church of Christ's Facebook page, and then I'll turn around and share it on mine. Um, my guess is most anybody who watches this will know that about me, though. We've been getting people joining us from all over the world, so maybe that's an unknown, and maybe our church circle is an unknown in your part of the world, so this could be fun information for you one way or the other. Um, since we've spent the last two days talking about um, kind of mainstream thought, uh, as far as the United States and as Germany goes in responding to the Great War. Looking at uh, a church and a group of Christians that diverge from that in some ways and, and then turn around and embrace it in others, I think is an uh, interesting thing to do. Um, so, uh, a few things to know about the Church of Christ, if you don't already. Uh, we do not have any sort of denominational hierarchy or leadership. Uh, congregations uh, have all of their own autonomy. Um, theoretically, each church exists entirely on its own. There have been plenty of arguments throughout history whether or not uh, churches should cooperate uh, in things like supporting missionaries or children's homes. And for the most part, those arguments are behind us. Um, not entirely. They still exist in some small pockets. But for the most part, that's, that's gone. Um, back in the 1800s, uh, you know, the what we now know of the Churches of Christ were uh, with two other groups um, that eventually split out, uh, independent Christian churches and the Disciples of Christ uh, being the other two. But by the time World War I rolls around, uh, for the most part, uh, those who are going to split out and go their own way have gone their own way. That's a generalization, but it's fairly accurate. Um, David Lipscomb becomes a major voice uh, through his writings uh, uh, as a contributor and then eventual editor of the Gospel Advocate, um, which is a uh, Church of Christ-oriented publication that comes out of Nashville. And he's incredibly important for the conversation today um, because the best way I can think to describe uh, Lipscomb is as a full-on separatist. Um, for him, the idea that Christians could exist uh, peacefully, um, with no, uh, and peacefully is not really the right word, but that's the best one that comes to mind. With uh, no conflicts with the government, uh, that idea to him was non-existent. Um, the idea of government in general was, as far as Lipscomb was concerned, counter to the gospel. Um, him and others in the Churches of Christ argued against voting, argued against military service, argued against participating or running for local government offices. Um, the idea that a uh, follower of Jesus could participate in 
a, uh, a government structure which was by its very nature evil um, was absolutely unacceptable to Lipscomb and several others. Um, and I want to point out there what, what I just said to make sure you understand. Um, Lipscomb believed that all governments were evil. Um, that their very existence was uh, pointed to the sin of the world and uh, in true Christianity they shouldn't be required but because the world was so evil uh, they existed kind of as not really a necessary evil uh, but as a, a creation of the evil of the world. Maybe that's a good way to say it. And I'm sure there are a handful of y'all who may come across this that are far more uh, are far greater experts on Lipscomb when it comes down to it. Please feel free to correct me. Uh, but that is kind of my read on him. And so the idea as the United States moves towards uh, the First World War, Lipscomb is you know getting towards the end of his life. He dies uh, in 1917 um, after the United States uh, declares war and begins training soldiers. Um, he is completely against... Uh, participation by uh, any true Christian in the in the war. Hadley, what are you doing? Baby girl, do not come down those steps. It is rest time. You need to go back to your room. Baby girl, you will be fine. Please go lay down. It's rest time and it's been an ongoing battle today, so... I hope you enjoyed that interlude as she makes her way back to her room. We'll see how this goes. Okay, she's... I can't see her down the hallway anymore, so she's at least hidden herself well enough. Then. Anyway, um, Lipscomb is certainly not alone. Um, I think uh, he has a pretty good influence in Tennessee, where the Gospel Advocate comes from. Uh, but the pacifism that he... Uh, preaches shows up in other pockets of the Church of Christ as well. Um, one of the great parts about uh, doing the reading for this part of the paper was that I come across some absolutely stellar quotes. So we'll let Lipscomb uh, set it up for us. Um, and this comes before World War I. He writes this in response to the Spanish-American War um, in 1898. Uh, when asked uh, whether, a, or when asking the question, he kind of poses it himself and then answers it, whether or not a Christian could participate in military action. He said, Does anyone believe that if Jesus were here, he would make war speeches and encourage the spirit of war? Would he kill and destroy men? To Lipscomb, the answer was an obvious no. Um, he publishes in the Gospel Advocate a pamphlet that young men can take to uh, the recruiter's office um, to uh, show their reasons for being conscientious objectors. Um, the Church of Christ during World War I accounts for the seventh most number of conscientious objectors um, uh, to participation in the war. Um, there are others who pick up that torch and run with it, um, but one of the best stories that comes out of it is a small a little town in southwest Oklahoma, not that far from where I just moved here from, called Cordell. Uh, at the time, Cordell had a small Christian college called Cordell Christian College, where the uh, professors at that school and the students, um, the board of directors in general, were all pretty, uh, were along the same orientation as David Lipscomb. They weren't interested in war. They were uh, all for being conscientious objectors um, because of how they understood Jesus, with Lipscomb's quote being a perfect uh, model for that. Would Jesus do any of this? No, so neither will I. Um, but by the time uh, they begin to make waves in their community, and the community itself being fairly pro-war, which is maybe unsurprising, uh, given the conversations we had about uh, how Americans in general who were, uh, who were followers of Jesus were kind of primed by the beginning of war to understand Jesus' pro-war, um, especially this war, as far as a battle against evil, um, it becomes this big local conflict. Um, and by the time it all kind of irons out, several of the students and teachers from Cordell Christian College have been imprisoned in Leavenworth. Um, the college itself has been closed. The board has been let go. Uh, it has been repopulated with pro-war uh, leadership and then reopened. Um, whoops, I just 
tapped that screen, and now there's all sorts of things. Okay, and we're back. Sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, so there's a Christian university that's entire nature changes in the span of a very short period of time because of their response to the war um, and because of the conflict they immediately came into with the local community because of their response and I'd argue because of the conflict that this creates inside Christian circles in their community where they're saying no Jesus wouldn't and the rest of the community is saying yes Jesus would with gun and grenade on him to, to go into battle. Um, so those are not just political conflicts when they take place in Christian circles. They're obviously theological and religious ones as well. Um, so you see that happen uh, where, you know, you're talking about uh, young adults and some, some older men being imprisoned in Leavenworth. Uh, you can already see where there's plenty of argument to be made that that might be, you know, slightly unconstitutional. Uh, but whenever... Uh, you are trying to rouse a nation to war. Uh, voices that suggest that maybe it's not the right thing to do are not really welcome. And Woodrow Wilson is not known for uh, taking disagreements with his policies well. Um, there's one famous response that he makes uh, to somebody who, who writes a letter when he's campaigning for re-election. Um, and basically the letter is... Uh, kind of opposition research. It comes from somebody who disagrees with him, but it's somebody who's making a good argument. Like, how can you not understand that the loans that you're giving out and the arms that you're producing for people only on one side of this war uh, make it look like you're already participating? You know, people are uncomfortable with that. And Wilson's response is essentially something like, well, since you have access to many unpatriotic Americans and I do not, uh, which suggests that anybody who disagrees with his policy isn't a real American. Um, now, thank goodness we're better than that today. Pause to sip coffee. No, we do the exact same things today, don't we? Where if you disagree me disagree with me on this topic or this idea or this policy or this whatever, you're obviously not an American. Um, or that thought is un-American. Um, that move has been around for a long time. Um, Wilson embodies it fully, and so to him, uh, these uh, young men and these uh, men like David Lipscomb who are suggesting uh, that to participate in the war is uh, wrong, it is unholy, it is unchristian, uh, Wilson doesn't have a whole lot of interest in making time or room for them. The Gospel Advocate goes through all sorts of issues. Uh, they get shut down for a brief period of time. They end up writing more pro articles after Lipscomb's death. Um, and by the time World War II rolls around, just 20 years later, uh, the Churches of Christ in, uh, well, by the time the, the U.S. jumps in 25 years later, but, uh, you know, what's a few years here or there. By that point, the Churches of Christ are uh, boasting one of the highest participants, uh, percentage-wise, of young men in the Army. So in 25 short years... Uh, everything completely changes inside uh, the Church of Christ Fellowship. Um, that's not to say that there weren't uh, ministers and teachers inside the Churches of Christ who weren't pro-war uh, during the First World War. There absolutely were. Um, but uh, under uh, the influence of David Lipscomb and others, you see a fairly high percentage uh, who are conscientious objectors to the war. Um, I, I want to pull a couple of other uh, quotes here that are absolutely fantastic, um, I, but I, I failed to highlight them before I got started, so I don't want to... Uh, you're going to have to give me a second to, to find them. Um, Well, apparently, I am thinking of a quote that's not there, um, and I don't want to get it wrong, but that's unfortunate. Oh well, 
Um, I'm sure I'll find it as soon as I stop the live stream and, uh, and actually sit down and read through this again. Um, but uh, there's a, a couple of other things to take into account during this conversation. Um, to say that the political situation in the United States and in the world was very it was fairly different then than it is now would be an understatement. Um, you got to remember that even though this was, I mean, we're talking just over a hundred years ago. Even though this was just over a hundred years ago, uh, the German leader is an emperor. They're not a democracy. Um, Kaiser Wilhelm uh, came to the throne. Uh, via family bloodlines. Um, the same is absolutely true in Russia. Um, you know, the the Russian Empire, even though it's been shrinking a little bit and they've lost some land here or there, um, and their participation in World War I ends in the Russian Revolution. At the time all of this is taking place, uh, Russia is a, uh, is a monarchy. They have a czar um, who you know, has 99% of the power and there's sort of like a little token uh, elected Duma that can make some recommendations that the Tsar pretty regularly shuts down. Um, it's a very different world. Um, there is a... Uh, there is an idea that has been around for, uh, you know, several decades by th this point that uh, the world itself is primed to completely change its political nature. Um, the fall of uh, the monarchs in France, you know, give you a nudge that direction. Um, the fact that England has slowly moved towards democracy, um, even though they still have a king um, who has some influence, that's not the same as uh, having any sort of real deciding power. Um, there's a... Uh, there's a fairly powerful uh, socialist pull um, that exists during this time. Um, Louis Bartas, who is a uh, French soldier who writes some memoirs after the world after the war, um, recalls a moment whether or not it's true or apocryphal because he's a good storyteller, uh, where. Um, the French and the German soldiers who were fighting each other became so miserable uh, during this one particular battle because there was so much rain, all the trenches filled up with water, um, that uh, they quit firing at each other. They climbed out of their trenches. In some places, their trenches are you know close enough that they can see each other's faces. Um, and at one point, they all... Uh, break down and cheer together against what's going on and then they sing the International which is sort of like the socialist in the international anthem um, there are certainly strong currents of socialism in the United States uh, Walter Rauschenbusch is a, a well Lyman Abbott is for that for that matter guy that I quoted last time um, who uh, push what what is known at the time as the social gospel um, that understand a or that see a connection between uh, Jesus communal ethics and socialism and believe that uh, true Christianity can be found in in that sort of political approach which is very different obviously than Lipscomb who believes that you can't participate in any way form or fashion um, but the other thing that's going on is that there's a rising current of communism that, that goes around the world at this point. Obviously it blows up in uh, Russia, um, takes root there in the Russian Revolution, um, which starts in 1917. Uh, if you want to do some really interesting reading, just read how Vladimir Lenin got from where he had been exiled uh, to Russia. Um, the short version of it is the leader of the German army puts him on a train to make sure that he gets there hoping that he will cause so much destabilization in Russia, who was primed for revolution, that Russia would pull out of the war. Um, he succeeds in the short term. The problem is you now have some long-term relationship issues that you've got to work out. Um, but the whole story is fascinating. and it, By all means, sit down and do some quick reading on that. And I say all that to say this. In uh, 
pockets of the churches of Christ, especially um, in northwest, uh, north central northwest Texas, uh, southwest Oklahoma, kind of Texas panhandle a little bit, um, there is a clump of churches of Christ that also double as uh, uh, kind of headquarters for uh, communism, which, you know, a hundred years later, you may be hearing that looking back going, oh, that sounds terrible. But you've got to remember that at the time, um, all that we really have to go on as far as communism goes is the idea. Um, you could argue that in some small places uh, who had tried it, you had seen you know, varying results. But really, this is before any of the uh, major communist states have come about. This is before uh, you can kind of pin some of the atrocities that happen uh, under the rule of those states on them and all it is is an idea. Um, and so in places like Cordell, where Cordell Christian College is, um, you have the kind of tied relationship between um, a communal approach to politics, um, which is what they would have argued communism is, um, and uh, a lack of participation in the war for various reasons. Um, so for those of you who live in uh, southwest Oklahoma uh, who attend the Church of Christ, just a heads up, if you dig far enough back in your church history, you'll find that your church leaders were all communists. Um, so enjoy doing that research. Um, and the last thing I want to return back to is just a reminder of what happens when, when you have this collision between religion and politics and culture. Um, and you could argue that all of those things are, are intertwined. I think that's fair. But they're not the same. They're separate strands that get kind of woven together in the fabric of our lives. And uh, what happens in the churches of Christ is that they move from a majority conscientious objector. Um, at this point... There aren't that many, uh, you know, members of the Churches of Christ. They're this fringe group. They don't have a significant voice, and they're pretty comfortable with their outsider status. That's how they would prefer it. Uh, in fact, you get plenty of voices arguing that that's how it should be. Um, they move from that to mainstream, uh, very similar outlook. Uh, on the relationship of church to government, uh, of Christians to government, of Christians to war, military service, in a very short period of time because of, uh, one, the discomfort that comes along with being singled out. Nobody really enjoys that. Uh, and when the pressure is ramped up on members of the Church of Christ, uh, as they watch some of their young men get you know sealed up in Leavenworth or as they get tired of being called cowards in print and in public, uh, they begin to shift because it's uncomfortable. Um, plus, you have uh, government um, censorship that uh, censors out or shuts down publications like the Gospel Advocate. Um, you have, uh, you know, the government picking and choosing what voices get heard during that time. Um, in some ways, that pressure still exists, even though we don't always acknowledge it. But certainly we see it then, um, where because of all of those things kind of coming together at the same time, uh, an entire uh, group of Christians shifts uh, how they function fundamentally in regards to uh, war and government. Um, it doesn't change overnight, though in some places it becomes apparent that it will it will shift quickly. Um, but it changes rapidly enough that by World War II, just two and a half decades removed, uh, there is no similarity uh, between the reaction uh, to World War I and the reaction of world, to World War II. Um, yeah, I think that's a good place to wrap up for today. Um, not a... A uh, ton of new information that I want to tack on here. Just wanted to give you an example of um, of something different. If we've talked about 
the you know kind of general American like United States Christian viewpoint of Jesus as this hyper masculine you know man and to be a follower of Jesus who is manly means you do manly things like go to war um, or uh, I, I wanted to make sure that we had another voice participating in the conversation to at least show that just because that was the majority doesn't mean it's the only uh, voice that's coming in to play during this time. All right, um, we'll do another kind of case study specific video tomorrow uh, where we will take a look specifically at Karl Barth, um, who is a major voice in uh, Christian theology in the 20th century. Um, we'll talk uh, extensively about his journey from uh, German liberal theology to uh, basically becoming the champion voice of a, uh, a, a new, new then uh, thread of theology that comes pouring out uh, in response to World War One and how uh, his relationship with his German professors uh, kind of shapes his response. All right, glad you were able to catch this video today and join us. Uh, we will do more tomorrow.